from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and Akashvani. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news, features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Alison Mitchell in London, where it's been a pretty fun and busy week. Uh, nice at the London Palladium, which I've never done before, despite living in London for about 15 years. And uh, oh, an AGM for a board that I sit on as well. A cricket season is still ongoing, fit in a bit of horse ride as well. And I um, also watched a documentary on corruption in cricket, which I think aired in India before it made its way over here for streaming. But Caught Out is the name name. If you get a chance, take a look. Very interesting. Brett Sprigg here for the ABC in Sydney, where our international summer is just around the corner, of course, with our Aussie women in action against the West Indies. Bit of fallout, too, from our men's ODI series in South Africa, which I'm sure we'll touch on at some stage. Australia, of course, five-time champions in that format, but uh, some pre-World Cup fine-tuning to do, of course, with a series against the host nation, India. So a bit to work through there from an Australian point of view. Well, speaking with the host nation of the World Cup, hello, this is Charu Sharma for Akashwani. No complaints here in terms of the standards of Indian cricket after that Asia Cup crazy win. Of course, I unfortunately wasn't too well. I had to bail out of a couple of assignments. I should have been in Doha right now for the first ever Gulf Cup, but not to be, Emma. Very glad to be home, by the way, in Bangalore, having looked after myself and all the rest of the little medical situations I got into. But uh, just a little bit of, not controversy, but talk on, on the selection of the Indian team for the World Cup. But I do think as a, a home team, they are one of the title contenders for sure. More on all of that much later. Yeah, definitely. Great to see you at home and well, Chari. We're really glad to have you Thank with you. us this week. Um, a lot of the England men's team who are tuning up for the World Cup, they're taking a little bit of a, I'll say, a minor break at the moment because there is a series going on with Ireland, but it's largely uh, a very different team. Joe Root's looking to get a bit of a form under his belt, though, so he is featuring that uh, ahead of that departure to India. Uh, but first on Stumped this week, we're going to hear from an effortless genius batter and wicketkeeper with a precocious talent. And they're just some of the words that have been used to describe South Africa. Africa's Quinton de Kock. Now, he's already retired from tests and now at the age of just 30, he's retiring from one day internationals as well. But not until he's had a crack at lifting the upcoming World Cup. Now, since de Kock's ODI debut in 2013, only Virat Kohli, Rohit Sharma, Shikhar Dhawan and Joe Root have scored more runs in the format. He currently sits seventh in South Africa's overall list of ODI run scorers. But he's also courted some controversy, most notably when he pulled out of a T20 World Cup match two years years ago after Cricket South Africa mandated that the team should take the knee in support of the Black Lives Matter movement. He hasn't done that many interviews, in-depth ones, that is, throughout his career, but now he's played his last ODI on home soil. I asked him just what it was like walking off to a standing ovation in the victory against Australia in Johannesburg. I'm pretty sure that after the World Cup, I think the feelings will be a bit different. I'm not too sure. Um... Obviously, playing the last my last two games, uh, once at Centurion, uh, one of the Wonders were quite emotional, and the team were also emotional, which is quite nice. Um, but yeah, I woke up this morning um, feeling normal again. Um, so yeah, maybe I'm pretty sure after the World Cup, um, we'll probably be emotional again. Uh, but then once that's done, um, I'll just fit back straight into life again, I guess. Uh, what were the main factors behind it? Obviously, there's the, the opportunities that arise in, in franchise cricket. Um, to what extent does family also play in this decision? I don't think I can play cricket for too much longer. Um, I think my body is is a bit sore and I don't want to be a, a, a an old man that can't do much one day. So, you know, I still want to have a, a body to move around, uh, especially the things that I do. I'm quite an active person. So, um but I'll push to where I can. Um, obviously, SA leagues have now come about. Um, you know, it's just a thing to finish up on on a career. Um, don't know how long I'm going to play for. There's not going to be any more ODI cricket for me and obviously no more test matches for me. Uh, my body will have more time to regenerate because uh, obviously T20 cricket is not that hard on the body. I'd spend more time with my family, um, have a bit more time off. This makes it a bit easier for, for myself and the people who who surround me. Did the opportunity with the Renegades almost come as a bit of a, a sort of tipping point because that was going to clash, wasn't it, with the India series in December? Yeah, to be honest, I think I was, in, we were in talks with the, because I knew my retirement when it's going to happen a, a while ago already. Um, I only announced it um, recently, but I knew it was going to happen 
uh, a long time ago already. Um, so I was, we were chatting to to the Melbourne Renegades a while ago already. So it finally came out that we playing against India, but I already had plans for, for the Big Bash before that. So um, it was, it became a bit of a gray area, but like I said, it was, I was always going to retire anyway. And obviously with me being part of the Big Bash and the whole the whole series coming up, there was obviously people started asking questions and then, then I was just like, you know what, let me just announce it now. Temba Bavuma um, was saying the other day, I read that you know, he feels like in this last year or so, you've been almost your most sort of relaxed, the most free, the most bubbly around the team that he's known you. Do you think that was... Well, first of all, do you think that's sort of true? Have you felt that way? And is that perhaps because you knew that, you know, you'd made this decision? Okay, so I think I'm just getting older, um, just trying to enjoy my cricket more. I enjoy being around my teammates and my, my teammates and my friends. Um, obviously, as a youngster, you, you're so intense because you want to do so well all the time and you're always putting the added pressure on yourself. And then as I've just gotten older, I think I've just become more relaxed, I think. I think that's it. I don't know if it was a retirement or it's just me getting older. So, yeah, it's just me just trying to have fun. And over the years, Quinton, I haven't seen too many in-depth interviews with you. Is, is that sort of your general nature? You, are you quite a private person, would you, would you describe yourself as? Yeah, I give my... I give Lucy... <laughs> uh, your media media manager. <laughs> media managers um, trouble quite a bit. I uh, will try and stay out of the out of the alarm light or the screen. Um, well, not, it's not really for me. I just don't want to be part of it. I just want to just play cricket um, and not try and stay away as much as I can for what, what comes with being a professional cricketer. Yeah. I like to just get on the field, just play, be with the guys. Um, and then that's it, as if I was playing club cricket. Yeah, <laughs> which is very, I guess, a, a difficult sort of line yeah. to tread, isn't it? I yeah. suppose if, if I... Is that at times, could that have led to you being misunderstood a little at times throughout your career? And and I suppose I I look back towards the, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement when you you chose to stand rather than take a knee and at times opted not to maybe talk about it, which of course I guess came, came to a head when you didn't play the match in the T20 World Cup when, a, when an instruction came to take the knee. But I wonder first, was, was there your rationale for sort of opting not to give your opinion about it at the time, does that just go back to you wanting to be a private person? Look, we had a, we all had a choice and obviously when the whole Black Lives Matter thing came up uh, in the team, when we all discussed about it and, you know, we, we thought, you know, as a team, we, we can all have our, our own views on it. Obviously, I think people from around the world see Black Lives Matters in different ways and different cultures. I know that we see it, you know, people from the UK or America or all around the world, like I say, um, see things differently uh, in our own worlds. And, and yeah, we all, a couple of us made a decision not to get on the knee, but we were in support of the guys who were, because um, we understand their background. Uh, we sat down as a group and we all chatted about our backgrounds and all that. And, you know, we all had an understanding of each other we got the, the directive from from the top and it was the whole scenario of our game, um, telling us the morning of the game, you know, how they're instructing us to get interfering in our team culture when they should be worried about bigger things than the Proteus, you know, the board members, they should be worried about, um, you know, just, uh, just didn't sit well with myself and a couple of guys in the team, but if they need something to be said in the team, doesn't matter who you are, I'll be the guy to back you up or say it. I'm, I'm okay doing that. Um, and then I told us, it said, said uh, sorry, but this directive is, doesn't stand well with me because the way they've done it. And it's about sort of you feeling like you had a, a sort of right taken away from you rather than yes, an, an objection to taking the knee. No, it's, it's not about uh, objections. It's about you've taken someone's right away and, you know, who are they to force someone to do it? It doesn't matter if they're my boss or unfortunately in cricket, it doesn't work like that. You know, it's in the way the world cricket works now. Um, cricketers are becoming their own bosses now to a point. 
And in order, and when you think you can tell a player what to do, and you you expect them to listen to you, I I, I can promise you most players are going to turn around to you and say no. That's not how it works. Unfortunately, that's the way cricket is going. It's not quite what it used to be. And I felt that was a big thing for me. Like I said, what? you take someone's right and I, and I wasn't going to let someone take it away from me. And unfortunately, it was in a public in a public space, which was obviously at the time was quite, quite, uh, quite stressful. But um, you know what? I thought I did was, was right. So yeah, not just for me, and it wasn't just for black, but to show the team that you can stand up to what's what's right and what's wrong for your rights as a player and stuff. So it was more of a bigger picture for me. What happened then between um, that day when you didn't play the match and, and then when um, quite sort of a lengthy and considered statement came out from you where um, you said, yes, if you if taking the knee helped to educate others and make the lives of others better, you, you were happy to do so. But also it was about a, a sort of a sense of, if only we had all sat down and discussed things sooner. What what sort of happened between that day and then that statement coming out? Do you feel that it actually did shift something for the better in that sort of team board environment? Yes, I think it did. Um, like I said, probably the way it was all handled, probably even myself, not a, wasn't the timing was off totally. It was not good timing. But I thought for the better of the team, and I think the board now now can see what how serious we are as players you know we're not just pawns to csa you know it's just all about that and then we still sat down and spoke afterwards as players um even though we spoke so much before uh thoroughly before before the whole world cup and then we had to sit down and speak about um things again and then we had a meeting with the board you know we shared our views it wasn't just me it was everyone i actually hardly said anything I just sat there and listened pretty much. And then a lot of guys were emotional to the board oh, straight after our game. We called they called in a meeting that night. So that was a, a little while ago now. Um, I guess, yeah, a, a lot has happened. Um, you retired from tests in December uh, later that year as well. And that was just before your first child was born, wasn't it? Has that kind of freed up a certain amount of your life where you've, you've got a, a happy work-life balance lead up until this point with, with family and what you're able to do outside of cricket? Yeah, look, I don't know if it freed me up because try dealing with the <laughs> with a with a newborn. Um it's a lot, lot tougher than, than what I thought it was gonna be. Um but no, it's it's been great. My my little girl Kiara, she's as cute as ever. Um you know, she's amazing. She loves she loves being with myself and my wife Sash. Um, you know, and she's we do a lot of we spend a lot of time with her. We try and show her the world. Um not just, I don't want her to see dad on tour the whole time. I want to be part of her life also. Um, I don't want to miss her growing up. Um, next thing you know, by the end of her career, I've had, she'll be maybe like five or six, and I don't want to miss those years. I want to see, see and help her and teach her as much as I can and see watch her grow. Will you get some more time for fishing? Is, is that still remain a big way of how you switch off between cricket commitments? To be honest, since I retired from test, I've obviously thought... I'll get more time. I've actually had less time because I've played so much more T20 cricket. But I've I do a little bit um, when I can. Um, obviously, one of my one of my good friends, Dale uh, Dale Stone, uh, we go fishing up in the Chobe quite a lot, St. Beza River, um, and we go. Well, I don't go around the world as much as he does now because he doesn't have cricket anymore. Mm. He just has a bit of coaching, and so he's, obviously he has more time, but. I'm sure once uh, my, my cricket slows down, I'll we'll be partners again, traveling the world and going fishing and stuff. Yeah. Well, the biggest task in hand then cricket-wise in front of you now is this 50-over World Cup in India. Um, your South Africa coach has indicated that you've got, it in his words, unfinished business. Does that go for the, the team as a whole, do you feel? Yeah, I think we've, we have we want to just go and show that we the best, we can be the one of the best teams. I think we've let ourselves down in previous World Cups and also been a bit unlucky. And we just want to, even if we don't lose, I mean, even if we don't win, at least prove to ourselves that we, what we're capable of. And, you know, our talent is not just lost or, you know, we want to showcase our talent at the best level we can. Because um, it's, it's a World Cup. It's the hardest tournament of the 
of the calendar year. And if we win, it would be absolutely amazing. But if we don't, we at least we can finish on a high note as a team because um, I think we've got some really, really special players in our, in our unit. Um, and we just want to go out there and showcase and just do the best we can. Well, that was South Africa's wicketkeeper, Quinton de Kock, retiring from ODIs after the World Cup. Um, it was really fascinating to chat with him. And I felt he sort of warmed into the interview as it went along. Came across, I think, as a quite a principled man. Um, I think in particular, though, you know, those principles sometimes can have adverse effects, as we saw with the incidents around that, the T20 World Cup, the, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement around taking the knee. But I thought he was actually quite eloquent in explaining his perspective uh, on that. Um, he will obviously be on the T20 franchise circuit, Charu. He's only 30 to be you know, stopping ODIs alongside having stopped tests. Was there anything that surprised you about the fact that he's chosen to step back from this particular format now? Not at all. I think a lot of people are choosing to go in the franchise format around the world because it does pay the bills. And uh, I'm not suggesting that T20 cricket is any less intense or uh, as difficult as, as other forms of cricket. But, uh, you know, you stay relevant and, and you earn a living because, after all, remember, the shelf life of a sports person is, is uh, probably one of the smaller ones of many other trades in the world. But just a couple of things, if you don't mind, a little bit of time work. One, I, you know, it's a, I mean, with due respect to Quinton de Kock, yes, he did mention that his right was taken away as an individual. But sometimes you work collectively as a team and, and as a board, as, as a higher authority. And I do feel it would mean perhaps better for him to have done what the rest of the team was doing and then take up the matter with CSA and say, listen, let, let's not try and have these diktats come down. So maybe there was an error there. And also, it's okay to be uh, an introvert. But I do think that especially franchise cricket and, and so much uh, of the rest of the world of sport is really bolstered, is pushed forward because of the fans, because of what they bring in, the commercial interest and everything else. So to my mind, you know, this whole cabal business of me and my team and that's it, and I don't give a damn about everybody else, is a little awkward because I do think the first set of people that sports persons owe to are the fans. And whatever you requested to do, for heaven's sake, do it for the fans because otherwise play in a jungle and don't get paid for it. So there are a couple of issues that, you know, perhaps, he, you know, as a, as a global sports person, somebody who's been more successful than not, uh, he and others need to, to take care of, to understand why you're doing what you're doing and why you're being paid for it. But otherwise, of course, I, I hope he does well uh, here at the World Cup. He's done well in India before as well. And after that, if he chooses, like many other people are, to ply his trade in the various franchise forms of cricket uh, going around the world and mushrooming, great for him because I think he's done enough for South Africa. He's done a lot for South Africa. Absolutely right. And I'm wondering about sort of what's next. And he is obviously a big marquee signing for the Big Bash League. So he'll be on about $400,000 or maybe just under that for the Melbourne Renegades. So it'll be a big opportunity for him to be a marquee star in that competition and reignite interest in that, I guess, flailing in some ways uh, T20 franchise competition. But as far as what's next, um, obviously he'll retire from one day. As I wouldn't be surprised if his T20 retirement comes after the next World Cup, which is mid next year. But in the meantime, there is that series with India, a three-match series in December of T20s, which falls during his Big Bash stint. So he's going to be faced with another of those conflicts fairly soon. Mm. But uh, I think, to your point, he's not an old man. He's only 30 years of age, turns 31, I think, during that uh, India series, if he plays that, still has a lot to offer world cricket. I think the thing that players at that age enjoy the most is you don't have to do a lot of practice in a dense franchise <laughs> tournament schedule. <laughs> so made it very clear to... he's not going to miss the practice, didn't he? <laughs> you're, yeah, you're only fronting up and playing. So maybe he'll, uh, he'll certainly enjoy that. Well, that's all we've got time for on this week's Stumped. So I'll say thanks to Cherry Sharma and to Brett Sprigg and to all of you. And we'll do some more again next week. We'll see you then. Bye for now.